are live. Yes. Hi, everyone out there in YouTube land. This is Roxanne from Human Colony TV. We are doing uh, their second edition of Story Time. What it is is any of our members who like to tell a story, their story, it doesn't matter what it is. We want to just experience storytelling. And uh, this week is going to be the presenter, rather, is going to be Kim, our very own Kim. Say hi, Kim. Hello. Very good. There she is. And um, so it's, um, no, I, I think that's about it. Yeah, awesome. So thanks for joining us, and we love you guys, and uh, enjoy the story, and we'll talk to you later. So, Kim, you're up, and I'm going to put you as presenting, and then you're rock and rolling, and then I'll mute. <laughs> okay. Thanks, All right, baby. Rick. Rock and roll. Thank you. I, guys, I'm just going to talk about my this lifetime experience. Um, and I'll, I will go as far back as I can. And I'm really open to questions. Nothing is out of bounds. Um, doesn't serve anyone to hold secrets, in my opinion. So um, if anyone just wants to fly something at me, go ahead. Um, all right, obviously. My name is Kim. Uh, I go by the name Kim Louise now. I dropped off my married name. Um, and that resonates very highly with me because my mum always used to call me. So um, it feels good. Uh, all right, I'm going to start at my beginning in this lifetime uh, with conception. I do have a very vivid memory of being conceived into this lifetime. It's something that I experienced, oh goodness, 20, 30 years ago. I'm giving my age away now. Oh, I should also say I'm an Australian, yay, from Victoria. And so is Maya, but yeah. Um, I was always, always very interested in all of this stuff. So when I began to explore it, when I was in my late teens, early 20s and become active in it, not just reading about it, not just feeling an affinity, not just my own feelings coming up, I actually started to participate. And one of the ways I started out was to do a process that was called rebirthing. Um, I mean, that word in itself brings up a whole lot of meanings for different people. and. They've changed the name now. It's called Conscious Connective Breathing. And it is a trance state. So I had this wonderful boss. And two of them were wonderful bosses. And I was with my husband at the time. We weren't married. And we were both working in the same place. And we had the same bosses. It was this couple uh, who were roughly double our age. And it was kind of a parent-child situation. But so Valerie. Valerie was... The, the lady obviously and she had been exploring for a lot of her life as well um, and she was training to learn how to become what's called a rebirther and as a result of that she was traveling to do that and the person who's teaching that still does it in Australia here um, it's a process rebirthing is a process it's a trance state and it's very important to have someone that you trust to be with you and guide you through it. And I was blessed to be able to do that for her, for my rebirther. Um, turned out I was a natural at it. But anyway, when in my experiences, also going into the trans state, it was very easy. Um, and I would say I probably had about 20 rebirth sessions. Um, and technically what happens is the, the stuff, the stuff that's right under the surface will come up first and it's addressed and dealt with and healed. Um, it takes a period of processing and then the deepest stuff will come later. In my case, I'd had about four or five rebirths and I was getting very effective mem remembrance of, of early, early youth. Um, and then suddenly, one day in this process, um, I had this complete experience and I was just 
I just went for it. I, I saw it and I went for it so fast. I'm, go, I'm going with this. I'm going with this. I could feel myself. I mean, I say I saw it. I didn't. I felt it because I know it was me. And I felt the experience of being where I was in readiness to be conceived. I knew my time had come. I felt completely whole. I felt that feeling of being connected to all and I was very connected to spirit. It was such a beautiful, beautiful process. And then I had the experience, and this might sound a little bit out there, but coming from a very spiritual point of view, it meant very little. But I remember the process of actually the conception of you know, mum's egg and dad's sperm and as they united and then I entered, I came in and I still felt like I was this little existence in space in that. I was still so connected. If All I had done was just shift where I was. So I do have a very clear remembrance of that and a clear idea of what peace was what peace is and I did have some idea of why I was coming in. Now my I technically should not have been conceived. My father had mumps as an adult after he got married and he was told it was highly likely that he would be sterile. Well obviously as it turned out he wasn't and so from there I experienced my parents' joy when they found out that mum was pregnant. Um, the way that I experienced it was I was very connected to mum, obviously emotionally but also physically. But with my father, I was so incredibly connected to my father as well. And I have memory of my dad putting his hands around my mother's stomach and the sensation that I felt in those moments, it's, it completely washes over you. Whatever goes on around a pregnant woman, I always encourage them to please understand that you're influencing your child with everything that you do. And I felt incredibly wanted and I felt very loved and there's no doubt that my parents were soulmates. They've been married for like 60 years, I, I, I couldn't even tell you how long and they say they've never had a fight and I could attest to that, they never had. So that process of, of being in gestation and growing and then as my body grew and I, I began to experience limitation, limitation of my physicality, physicality. I had this much space to fit into and that was it. And that was the point when I started to become more connected with the three-dimensional idea that I was of mass to understand that, yeah, I'm growing these legs and yeah, I'm growing these arms and I'm feeling the love for my parents and I mean without getting to uh, <laughs> TMI, even when they would interact very intimately, that was a great experience for, for me. Even mum, when she was pregnant, my, my dad had such love for my mum and my mum back for my dad. It was just amazing to feel that. I didn't know at that time that how blessed I was. Um, it's a very, as you come to understand that you are related to a physical mass, um, it, that's where you move, that's where the remembrance starts to leave. So, okay, so I go going on through this pregnancy with my parents, aware emotionally and telepathically, very telepathically what's going on around me. Then it came time for me to be born and I wasn't in any hurry to get here. 
obviously I was happy to be where I was with mum and dad in that situation it was pleasant I didn't want to leave I had fear I knew it was coming and it was my first experience of fear so yeah, my mum had to be induced she went 10 days over um, by that stage she was very uncomfortable and by that stage I was beginning to feel a little bit uh, nervous I guess you would say I knew my time was coming the beginning and I will call it the beginning um, so I remember the feeling of mum being taken into hospital and her apprehension and in those days the fathers just didn't come in they just were hanging around in the hospital so they induced me it's the only way that I was going to come out and mum had a bit of a tough time it was a fairly long labour um, but she did accept drugs she didn't have an epidural but she did accept uh, pethidine and those kinds of things and that all affected me as well that affected my memory of being born so within this rebirthing experience again let's say I've got, um, we're going down maybe five more uh, rebirths beyond the conception idea and I get to my birth and I have very very vivid memory when my mum started to have contractions I could feel the pressure and it's what it felt to me it felt like pressure it was I don't want to do this but I have to and it's being forced I have to do it I gotta go so I have from there and and the realization that I was coming out um, I had very also vivid memory of coming through the birth canal uh, and then actually uh, crowning and then being born um, apparently I only cried a tad but I was full of pethidine as well and <laughs> um, from there my mum for some reason was never able to breastfeed I rejected her and when I had memory of that even at that age I had some resentment going on because I didn't want to be there I wanted to go back I wanted to be in mum's belly so ultimately I was losing weight they put me on the bottle the rest after that it was pretty peaceful I had a couple of years where it seemed as if I felt completely understood who I was what I used to do as a child um, I felt the love of my parents then my second brother was born sorry my first brother was born two years and two days after me and mum and dad were so effective in involving me in that that I was I was very excited so very excited that I was going to have a little baby at that time you didn't know what sex it was going to be and I can remember my earliest memories talking about choosing names you know mum and dad used to get me involved doing things like that so again he was induced also I don't blame him um, and he came into the world and he was a very placid child and I was very willing to embrace him and mum and dad would allow me to do things like feed him when he was able to eat solids um, help out with changing the nappies help out with bath time all those kinds of things at that time mum was a stay-at-home mum dad was off at work that's the way it was when I was born and so I, I had great love for my brother and I never felt any rivalry um, until the day he let my bird out anyway <laughs> um, after that even and I, there's a picture that I have when I'm about four my brother's about two and I used to live in the pool I was always in the swimming pool and he'd been in the pool as well we got out and we hopped in the bath and we're in the bath together 
And I knew for some reason at that time, I remember so clearly thinking it, remember taking this photo, remember taking it. And I do and I remember it and every time I see that photo, I remember what I wanted to show is how much I love my brother. So I'm hugging him in the bath, I'm like, you know, like this around him in the bath and squished him all up and, you know, that, that photo is very precious to me now. Um, so then going on from that, spiritually I was having experiences. I was, I was completely into dressing up. And and you know playing out different roles, different beings, music. My goodness, you know back then it was tape to tape, the big reels, and Dad would put that on for me, and they would leave me, and I would get dressed up. I'd have full range of the lounge room, and you know I was doing these grandiose gestures, you know, <laughs> running up on top of the sofa and coming off what I thought was all very elegantly, and you know all that kind of stuff. And I loved my playtime. And then I got to kindergarten and that was my first experience of playing by someone else's rules. And that is where I began to question myself, what my natural urges were, uh, what I wanted to do and being told pretty much, no, this is what we're going to do today and this is how it's going to happen. Um, and so I went with the flow because I wasn't a disobedient child at all. I had this this innocence of to most most of us do at that age. So I started kindergarten, and I have a lot of lovely memories about that too. I met a friend who I still talk with to this day. Um, my mother became pregnant with my youngest brother. He was an accident. We love to stir him about that. Um, and when he was born, mum and dad decided to move. This was when I was around seven. This is when everything changed for me. I felt like I was in the right place at the right time and everything was good. My mother gave birth to my brother in this time as well so I had two young brothers. I was diagnosed with a hernia when I was seven and I had to go into hospital for surgery. Again, in those days parents didn't stay and I had two younger brothers. Mum and dad were trying to shuffle things around and get in to see me as often as I could. Five days I was in there and I had some very three-dimensional experiences at that time and it wasn't so much around the surgery. Little instances that I remember, my father, he knew that I was anxious. This is where my anxiety started. I was anxious about them coming back. When were they going to be able to come back? I was still trying to deal with how on earth are mum, gonna, mum and dad going to fit three of us on their lap. That was my first thought when I found out that my mum was pregnant. Anyway, I'm digressing. My dad leaves me with a watch and explains to me how the, it, the watch works and when they're going to come back. And I panicked. I fell asleep, felt comfortable, I knew they were coming. I woke up, I looked at the, I looked at the watch, I panicked. I couldn't tell time. I had no idea. And that became a real drama. Uh, there was a male nurse and he was the first male nurse I'd ever come across. I didn't even know men could be nurses and he had a ponytail and we're talking uh, early 70s here and I don't know, he was like one of the first angels I ever met. He came to me, he could see I was distressed and this was even before the surgery. And he spent, it felt like hours, sitting with me and reading to me. And I remember feeling that comfort feeling again. And I think it was around the time when they came in and they explained to me that they were going to give me a, they called it a prick, prick, I don't know, a needle, whatever it was, I don't know. And I just handed everything up. I just went, even though it wasn't a conscious thing, I did the emotional handing up to the universe. 
then I even knew to do that. So I have this wild memory of uh, being very sedated and going down a lift on Gurney. Well, you guys, if, they, if you ever go through that, that is trippy. The feeling of, of the lift, that, that force you get in your stomach when you're doped out and you're laying down, it's really interesting. And they put me under as quickly as possible. So that all happened. It came and it went and it was all okay. Um, like at home, knew, knowing full well that from that experience I was changed. My mum came up with this idea because my two-year-old brother wanted to crawl all over me and I had stitches. I had a lot of stitches. So she put me in the playpen so that he couldn't get to me, which was quite smart, I thought. Um, and I don't know why I remember that so much, but I do. Um, from there, mum and dad decided we were going to move and that terrified me. That absolutely terrified me. How am I going to be away from my friends? How am I going to cope? Anxiety. Again, we used to go around looking at houses and mum and dad tried to involve us the way they always had, tried to help us be excited. I was silent. I was just silent. I just felt this dread, an awful feeling of dread. And ultimately what they did was they built a brand new house. And again, they tried to enrol us. They took us there to, to see the progress of the house. I mean, obviously, they wanted to see it too. It was too far from my friends for me, way too far from my friends. New school, no, no. I truly felt where I was was my path. So we moved, and for a time, the house wasn't ready, and we were living at my grandmother's house and spread out amongst people in the street. I was incredibly distressed. My bubble of comfort had been completely burst. And my mum used to drive 20 minutes to take us to school until the house was ready and I used to feel physically sick. So I was that kid, that new kid, that would be standing outside my brother's classroom because he had started his first year. He hadn't changed schools. It was his first year at school. They had different play times to us. I was the one who was standing outside his room, his classroom, in tears because I was so distressed. I was missing my friends. I wasn't making new friends. I wasn't connecting with anything or anyone there. Nothing resonated with me, nothing. And that was the point when everything changed. Everything became a challenge. Everything was difficult. I used to I used to climb over the gate at school, run home, get through the toilet door, toilet window, to get inside the house. I didn't even care if my parents ca caught me. And obviously the school was picking this up and my parents were picking this up. I look back now and the school was working with my parents to try to get me resettled. So what they did was got me involved in a game called softball. It's like baseball, but we, it's a larger ball. Same rules, same theory, you guys probably know. And I ended up uh, being the pitcher and I became best friends with the catcher of the team. And it became a seven day a week thing in my life. It wasn't because I wanted it to. It was because that's what was being built around me to try to sell me in. So I began seven days a week, even at lunchtime, even at recess at school. My teacher was my coach. So all the time I was either playing a match or I was practicing. After school, before school, you name it. Weekends, I ended up playing for the state. Um, I had my coach, he was so hard on us, but I do have him to thank for how far softball took me. A, a, a coach wouldn't get away with it now with what he used to do. 
So I did all of that and I didn't love any of it. I did it for everyone around me except me. I had total I had a total understanding that I was not on my path, that this was not what I wanted to do and it wasn't what I was meant to be doing. I used to spend time. My username is Warm Water. I used to spend time and it's one of the ways that used to help me was I come home from school and mum and dad had a really big garden at the back and I used to ask could I go and water the garden and I would stand there for an hour and I would water the vegetables. And that was like meditation. As I got I was very close to my father. As I got older and boys started to be introduced into my life, think that all changed. Whoa. That all changed. My relationship with my father never really got back to being the same. He didn't cope very well with me interacting with the boys. So that's when I started to look outside of my family for my family. And school, high school, and I got to high school, I, I, that was traumatic. I was bullied and I never knew why. A girl laid eyes on me on orientation day. She was two years older than me and that was it. I walked past her in the toilets. It's the only interaction I ever had with her. And then she bullied me for two, three years afterwards. It was horrible. And at that time, nobody cared. You just had to suck it up and deal with it. So even more, I'm disconnecting with 3D, even more, more and more reasons to be hidden in my room, more and more reasons to look for people that I resonated with outside of school. Every single time I went back and I stayed with the friend that I uh, met in kindergarten, in where I felt I meant to be, and if that was every holidays I would go there. That's where I knew I needed to be. That resonated. I used to hang out for the holidays so I could go there and just be in that place. I began to meet more people there as she did. We were allowed to go and do things by ourselves. My first boyfriend, one of my first serious boyfriends was from back there. Everything important in my teenage years that shaped me happened while I was back there. So because I was still looking where I, for where I belonged, my mum began to buy these books that were called Wellbeing. We also had encyclopedias and I used to devour them. The encyclopedias I was always I would always stop at anything that was ancient, anything that was, you know, the hieroglyphs or, you know, pictures of gods and goddesses and and you know, I'd read about them but I remember just staring at the pictures. And I just, I just a knowingness as I connect with this stuff. My poor mother had three of her best friends all pass away in a very short period of time from cancer, and they were younger than I am now. And it was terrible. Mum was bringing more and more stuff, alternative stuff, into the household. She was leaving the material laying around. I was reading it. I was devouring it. And I wanted my tribe. I was looking for my tribe. So when I left school and I, I started working full time, I was involved with a guy. I'd been with him for five years and it it was rocky towards the end. I was He was a bit older than me. He was already working while we were together. I left school. I got my license. I began working, I changed, my life changed. So that was a relationship that even though you know, I can look back now and think, oh my gosh, you know, he did everything for me. Um, but I met my husband. So I broke the engagement to him and met my husband. Not long after that, I moved out uh, with a friend for a while didn't work so well. My husband was around so we decided that we'd move in together. That was a fast and furious relationship. It all happened very quickly. That's when I started to begin finding all these ideas of rebirthing. I did regressions, past life regressions. I did kinesiology. 
I did your own linguistics programming. I did regressions and rebirthing, which are one and the same. And then I started to become active in carrying them out for people myself. Not myself. I even rebirthed my own rebirther, which was the greatest honor. Um, and it brought a lot of healing to me. But the marriage was very rocky. My husband went more the, he was money motivated. I was spiritually motivated. Um, anyway, we were together for five years before we decided that we would have children. This was a pattern that I learned through the rebirthing process, you know, learning, being induced, what it felt like. Any, any change I ever made, I always needed to be induced to do it. That was my birth pattern. I wasn't proactive. Other people made decisions for me, and then I just went for the flow. So that included um, when the decision was made that we would have children. It was a spur of the moment thing. Let's just do it. Again, I handed it up to the universe, but difference was this time. I had explored the idea of attracting the child that you want. So my request was to start with was to bring through a spirit that I had the skill set to help them clear karma and help them become what it is they needed to become. And I ended up with this beautiful little girl and she was so attached to me. Uh, she, I breastfed her but she would just suckle for comfort. I didn't put her on hourly structured feeds or anything like that but she would just suckle for comfort. I couldn't be out of her sight. I couldn't express my milk. I couldn't go anywhere. I was with her all the time. Got a photo of her. We were so attached. I've got a photo of her when she's about probably 14 months old and I'm doing dishes. My girlfriend was there and Carly is sitting on my foot while I'm doing dishes. That's what it was like. It's just her and I all the way. So she was a very needy child. She was a very demanding child. Um, and I began to experience depression because my relationship with my husband was not good. I didn't know what was going on. So then we decided to have the second child. By the way, I fell pregnant the first time with the first child, Kalia. Second child, my request was an easy child, a child who would have an easy life and a child that, again, I could support. And that's what I got. I got little Brittany who was very placid. She was beautiful from the day she was born and she was easy. When she was six weeks old and Carly was three and a half, my husband had a full-on psychotic episode. He was hospitalized, completely detached from this reality anyway. It took six months. There was no guarantees that he was ever going to get better. And because of my situation with having the children and they were so young, there was no way that I could watch him. So they did what they call he committed him, which means he became uh, a, a patient of the state. It was up to them whether he was allowed out of hospital or not. He ended up in the high dependency unit. I know he must have done some horrible things. I saw injuries on him when I used to go in. I knew he was out of control. I explained everything about the rocky relationship that we'd had. And I was desperate for him to get better. My depression just got worse. I got really sick, but I was so giving to my children and giving to my husband that the only time I would think how sick I was was the minute before I went to bed and I prayed. And it took a long time, like I said, six months. And he did come out of it. And when he did, it happened like 
that he suddenly just said to me oh my god what happened and then he realized that it had been six months that he had been away and he suddenly remembered that he had children he didn't even remember that I was his wife when he was ill he knew I was someone important but he didn't remember he didn't know who I was totally had forgotten these children and I remember taking him to see Brit in the other room and he saw she was six months not six weeks anymore he was devastated absolutely devastated anyway that was really emotional it was tough we got back home and I ended up in a, what they call here a mother baby unit with Brittany to help sort out her sleep patterns because they were all over the place and also to give me time and also for assessment and so they diagnosed me with postnatal depression I got home in time for Christmas I was exhausted completely exhausted um, Christmas came and Christmas went things started to look up a bit my husband wanted to change jobs the stigma of what happened to him his ego didn't play well with that so he wanted to change jobs and he did he did well he had been diagnosed with bipolar he was medicated I didn't know he was messing with his medication but I started to know the times because I could see the symptoms so essentially I really had three children and it was tough so the following few years was just full of difficult relationships around me everywhere and even though he was medicated it made things sometimes I think it made things worse um, so then we get to the point we fast forward I was a full-time mum I worked from home we had our own business and the girls were used to be, be me being there picking them up every day taking them to school every day they knew no different they got into Kalia got into high school oh Kalia was a very anxious child very anxious and I know it was because of the relationship between her and my father uh, my husband um, she would dry reach She'd be in the toilet vomiting before she went to school every single year. She did not do change well. She did not want to leave me. She was suffering with separation anxiety and it was affecting all kinds of things. And ultimately, when she did settle, she would do something amazing every single time. She would win some award. She'd be recognized for something. She'd end up running the assembly. She was the school captain. Here was this child that at the beginning of every year she wasn't coping. By the end, she had mastered it. She was the best at it. It was just amazing to watch. Brittany quietly just went on with her life. Into school, no problems. Into kinder, no problems. Akalia was consistently just ingrained in my psyche. Not that I loved them any different or one any more than the other they just were more demanding of me in different ways so Carly finished high school uh, sorry primary school as school captain celebrated she was also given an award by our local MP it was a big deal she went on again to high school now she'd been at high school not long at all she started to complain about pain she started playing netball and I could see watching the netball each week she was getting more tired less energy and complaining about this pain and it was just instinct for me always when I want to know something that you know go to the internet like most of us I would sit there in the middle of the night and just hunt down I did this repeatedly so many times 
looking at the symptoms and hunting down what could this possibly be apart from cancer because everything said it's cancer. But I still kept looking. I kept looking for where is it going to say it's not cancer. Where It's got to be somewhere that says it's not cancer. I guess you could call it denial. We were taking her to doctors. Because of her age, and all of us eventually I found out when we got into the hospital, all of us parents had the same story. The doctors just do not automatically think of cancer in kids that age. So it took a while. She was having physio. They said it was growing pains. She had an x-ray and that showed a shadow. And the physio said, that's normal for a girl of her age who was going through puberty. It was there. No one saw it. She had her 13th birthday and that night she had a party. She sucked up the pain. Oh my gosh, I don't know how she did it, but she did. She sucked up the pain. She danced. She had a good time. And that night we had her at the hospital. We had her at a different hospital in emergency and they actually did something about it. Within 24 hours, we'd been told that she had a tumour, an 8 centimetre by 10 centimetre tumour in her pelvis, in her sacrum. So very quickly we were ambulanced to our children's hospital here. And being told that is one of those moments where you think you know where you're going. You think you know what you're facing. You think you have some idea what if you're just going to hold. When you hear something like that, suddenly you see everything, your entire day, every day of the rest of your life facing the loss of your child. And that's what I saw. It scared me to death. I didn't know how I was going to tell her. She asked. She knew. So we get into the hospital, the children's hospital, and you know, I cannot, I, I, I can't negate what they did. They helped her. She was affected greatly by the chemo, more than most kids were, but it was working. In the end, we almost lost her because of the treatment. And I had set up a regime of different kinds of health support. I had to work out the balance myself between what do I give her and when. Do I give her this on while she's on chemo or do I wait till she's off? Conflicting information everywhere. Um, I ended up with an official apology from our children's hospital, which you just don't get. But that was simply just because I was consistently researching. Um, ultimately, she went on to a hormone drug. It was a growth hormone in inhibitor. It was a trial drug. The kind of cancer that she had is predominantly one that happens in teenagers. It's not genetic. I think it has something to do with the growth plates. So I spent a year pretty much in hospital with her because she would not only have the treatment, then she would get sick from the treatment. She'd have no immune system. So she would be back in an ISO ward within seven days from the last chemo and we'd be there waiting for her to grow new neutrophils, which is young white cells. And once she showed signs of that, we could go home, we'd get a week at home and then we were back doing it all over again. When she was 13, going on 14, her attitude was, don't tell me what it is, just tell me what I have to do. And that's how we did it. She wouldn't allow the nurses to do anything that I could do. The only thing she'd let the nurses do would be to manage her medications and dress her port. She had a port that was inserted in surgery straight into her heart. There was a couple of lumen there. Didn't meant they didn't have to inject her every time. They could just hook up things to ports. You guys probably know about this. It's not unusual. 
that ended up being pulled out because it got infected. But ultimately, it was a, it was a good thing because it meant they said she got too sick. We're not going to give her any more treatment. We don't want to kill her. So that's what happened. Her 14th birthday we had at the same place as her 13th. There was this tiny kid. She was down to 45 kilos. There was nothing of her. No hair. Nothing. She had a dress on, her favourite dress. And it was way too big for her. But we let her wear it. And that day we took so many photos and she had a sense of achievement. I prayed that it was over. While she was in remission, every day, every minute of every day, I lived in fear that it would come back. I watched her so closely. I needed to look in her eyes to understand what was going on. Her anxiety became less. I guess everything became relative. Um, Eventually she went to, uh, throughout this time, my husband just sends me a text out of the blue one night. It was a Friday night. The girls were with me. I'm not coming home. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Very unusual. We just had our 20th wedding anniversary. We tried calling him. He wouldn't answer. He literally disappeared. He left us with no access to money, nothing. In the end we found out while Carly was sick, he went through a manic phase. We had transport business. He bought 28 trucks in a year. I was just simply signing forms. I was in the hospital running the business while chemo was dripping into Carly. And I was still doing all the paperwork and you can imagine the amount of staff we had and what that involved and all that had happened in 12 months. So then, okay, back to the night that I get the text message. Ultimately, we had to sell the house, the only house that Carly ever knew and was so important to her. Brittany was much more able to be versatile. She, she had to be without me for such a long period anyway. She was very resilient. So that got ugly. I found out from one of our employees where he was, what he was doing. He'd been having an affair and he moved in with her. About a year after that, Carly and Brittany wanted nothing to do with him. They tried to call him when he first left. He never answered, so that was it. They were done. Um, that got ugly. I'm not going to bore you with all of that. When she, Carly relapsed, she went to America with school and it was something that had been planned for three or four years. And I was worried. I was worried because she would be off all the health stuff that I had her on. Um, and it was a four week trip. So she went to Seattle with the school. She spent two weeks with the host family and two weeks with the class. And I got special permission for her to take her computer so I could Skype with her and I could look in her eyes. So that I made sure that that happened every day. And I could see her. She was deteriorating and she was trying so hard to hide it. And four days before she was due to come home, I said, please let me bring you home. She said, no, Mum, I'll regret it. When she said that, I knew. She was home for four days. She couldn't walk. Eight days before, she walked the Golden Gate Bridge. That's how aggressive this tumour was. This one was wrapped around her spine and she had spots in her lungs. So we went through that journey. The doctors weren't going to treat her here in Melbourne. And I begged them. I said where it last time. She's healthy. Please do it again. I did everything. We went to India. We did fundraising. There was a lot of publicity that happened. TV, radio, you name it. We did it. We managed to get treatment that worked, but we couldn't stay. 
we had to come home and once again things just slowly got worse I was getting ready to get her back to where we got the treatment that did work and suddenly she needed oxygen they had flared up in her lungs we couldn't fly her so the day came pretty much where she woke up in the middle of the night just screaming she couldn't breathe I always wonder about that how could she scream when she couldn't breathe but anyway so straight away we're in the hospital the hospital sends an ambulance out takes her in we're in emergency we spent about 18 hours in emergency and most of that time I spent away from her I was talking to people about palliative care they were talking to me about bringing hospital beds into my home they taught me how to administer morphine everything all the things I didn't want to hear and I barely got to see her you get in the ambulance on the way home and she needed something and we were only in a transport ambulance and the guys in the ambulance were so frustrated because they could have helped me but they weren't allowed to she needed a shot of morphine she was panicking so we worked with what we had the best we could and I gave her a shot a breakthrough after that she relaxed a bit um, she was breathing a little bit better by the time we got home no one had said anything to me in the hospital or in the ambulance that her, her needs for oxygen had gone up it didn't even occur to me to ask came to get to get out of the uh, ambulance they put her on the gurney she hadn't spoken she hadn't spoken since I gave her that injection and I panicked because they told me how much she'd been on on the way home and I didn't have that at home and it just turned into a scene like something out of a movie the doctor was called the doctor came around the palliative care nurse was called she arrived paramedics wouldn't leave wouldn't leave they wouldn't go I'm sure they thought I was going to turn around and say take her back the last thing she said she was sit, she was laying in the gurney in the middle of the house everyone else was running around trying to work out what are we going to do about this oxygen Brittany was standing with her and she said mommy's bed we slept together it's the only way she could sleep so she was put in my bed it's the last thing she said she fell into unconsciousness they put her on the heavy duty morphine a few hours well we weren't even home four hours I guess probably two hours into it she sat up it was really bizarre I don't even know how her body allowed her to do it. She sat up, she put her arms up as if someone was grabbing her and then she collapsed back on the bed and we all just looked at each other. I thought she's gone. So I started talking. I started saying to her, if you need to go, go. Don't stay for me. Don't stay for Brittany. You've been through enough. It's time for you to go. I spoke to her about going to the light. I spoke to her about knowing that there's people who love her there. I spoke to her about not being earthbound. I spoke to her about so much. And the nurse and the doctor who were there, thank God, they were so supportive. They encouraged us to speak to her. They encouraged us to help her. They encouraged us to comfort her. And she passed over. It's funny what you do when you're in shock. But I wasn't able to bathe her. I wasn't able to get her ready for the funeral parlor. I wasn't able to interact with the funeral parlors. My mother was there, and so was the palliative care nurse. We're, you know, heading for midnight that night, and they were organizing it all. I, I, I don't even know where I was, what I was doing. I was walking in, looking at her, and I was walking out again, and all around the house, just pacing. Brittany's in, in the toilet throwing up. The doctor who was there was holding her hair back while she threw up in the toilet. 
it just it was surreal so there was my spirituality and I brought the girls up to believe in all the things that I believe in I took them to see famous channelers when they came to Australia they understood the idea of spirit I'm so glad I taught them and time just went it was the 20th of December 2011 because Christmas being in there she was in the fridge for nine days that's all I could think about she's in a fridge she's in a fridge what it just messed with me nine days we had the funeral the funeral was huge they had to smuggle us in because we'd had so much publicity so they had to sneak us in through the back door and we wanted a private burial so they had to sneak us back out again from then on my memory I always say now I have AC and BC before cancer and after cancer things I could think of and things I couldn't think of I was suffering with post-traumatic stress I didn't know what to do with myself Brittany and I were suddenly alone even though I'd offered for her to see her father that happened but that got ugly too I was in court while Carly was in hospital anyway so to get back on my spiritual journey and understand and, and you know consistently speaking with her making sure that she wasn't hanging around too much she wasn't my grief wasn't keeping her earthbound um, we moved and that put in another big change and I decided I was ready I was ready to look for a channeler to channel Kalia and I found Jim and I found you guys I watched a bit of Jim and I'd always had an affinity with the alien idea myself anyway and I was mesmerized absolutely mesmerized I thought oh you know there's my tribe there they are they're right there and I booked a channel I booked a session with Jim and I started interacting immediately with the people in the group and I was starting to feel I was starting to experience life again I wasn't just being that was part of the lesson that's when I got it it was during that time it was a time when Jim didn't know whether he could channel spirit or not I said I don't, I don't mind no expectations and sure enough took her brought her through blessed to her and here's this 60 year old man American man sitting there looking at me so intense straight at the screen in my eyes saying hello mummy <sighs> doesn't happen he even said it was an Aussie accent I knew it was her there was no doubt and it was a beautiful interaction and one of the other the things I remember when I absolutely fell in love with Tuko was when I was crying and Carla had left and I apologized I said I'm, I'm sorry Tuko said no it's fine and she looked straight in my eyes again and she tilted her head you know like a like a curious child she was so beautiful and she said it's so interesting how deeply you humans feel and I just right there right there that was my world in that moment that was my world I found it 
how it will be there. Then started to understand. I started to interact with the community. Found that initially I had some translation ability. Languages came pretty quickly. Channeling began, auto channeling at first. Another session with Jim, tolerable channel, and we'll talk. Told about the other channels that I would have and that there's more coming. And I was, for once, I was back on my path after all these years. I was back home. So, I mean, most of you know my journey through Hugo and how it all began and what it's brought me and how it's enriched my life. And I have Carly to thank for it. Alma Tuck said, well, actually it was to her, another session with Jim. I was actually, it was so strange because I, was, I knew what to had been doing. I knew the work she was putting in for the human species. And in the session, it kind of became a bit of me counselling to her. And then she looked up at me at one point and she said, you will channel Amatol. And I said, you know, that's lovely and I was grateful. I had no idea who he was um, and just went on with the session. And then when Jim came out of trance, he told me who Amatol was and I just couldn't believe it. I, I was just so blown away. And I was also told that I would receive great gifts. And that wasn't something that I really registered because that's not what any of it was about for me. I was channeling at that time. And the greatest gift that I could ever have came not long after I started channeling Almatov. And that was being able to channel Kalia. That was amazing. That was full circle. That was 360 degrees. That was affirmation. That was everything. Feeling her and channeling her. And then when she leaves, she leaves you with the feeling of being pregnant with her. And it's beautiful. It's bittersweet, but it's beautiful. The other thing, the more I go, the more I channel, the more I do, the more of these amazing things come. Dancing. You guys know I do the channel dancing. I did put a link up. It's private. It's unlisted. But if anyone wants to see it, let me know. <laughs> I only did it, I don't know, maybe a week or so ago. Anyway. Carly was all about dancing. When she was little, we used to dance together all the time. She was pole dancing at four years old. I still laughed so hard. Because I thought, how on earth does this kid know how to do this? <laughs> she had her identity. was She was known as the sexy bitch. It's so funny. But she, st she said what she thought. She wore her baldness beautifully. She held herself up high. And she was sexy. Even though for every reason in the world her puberty was arrested, she didn't feel feminine, all of these things. She was so charismatic. It was amazing. So then suddenly when I'm dancing and I'm channeling, I was dancing with Kalia. That was such a moment. Dancing with her. Let me tell you, keeping up with a 17-year-old in spirit is hard. But <laughs> we do it. And it's another blessing. And it's another one of those gifts that I know our talk shared. And the other thing, of course, everybody knows about Rowie and I meeting and there's a total affirmation there that I know a lot of you probably aren't aware of. Rowie's date of birth is actually the same date that Kalia passed away. 
So I know absolutely now Kalia has never left me. She helped me to learn after all the lifetimes that I've been through, 17 lifetimes, you guys, to get the idea that there's life beyond death. And I don't mean on the spiritual side. I know all that. I had to learn that there's life beyond death, 3D. So rather than become a hermit, as I did in my other lives, rather than be hung because I was a white witch, rather than losing her so many times and cutting my own throat, suicide, finally. This was my Mac truck. Now my talk talks about this. This was my Mac truck. Never. My parents are alive. Everybody in my immediate family are well and alive. The first person I had to lose was my first child. And then I found Hugo and you guys and Kalia taught me how to live without it. It means so much to me what you guys have brought to my life, to my world. And I will always give back everything I have to every one of you. Because I thank you for, be, for being Hugo. I thank you for finding Hugo. I thank you for honouring me. I thank my channels. I thank Jim. I thank Max. I will forever be in your debt. So I don't get to hang out as much anymore, but that's okay. I know you're all still there and I'll still feel you and when I do get a chance to meet some of the new guys who come through, it's so awesome and I'm so blessed to be doing private sessions and bring people peace and I'm so grateful to Kalia for leading me to Jim in the first place. She talks about it. She says how hard it was to get me to click on the buttons that took her there, took me there. <laughs> it's funny. So yeah, this time I'm living and I'm not only living, I'm blessed to be living exactly what I've always wanted. So I guess that's my story. And here I am today, sitting amongst you guys that I love so much. And whoever else ends up watching this, with the most intense love and the most gratitude I could ever share with you all. So no matter what, you guys are stuck with me. So if anyone's got any questions, anyone wants to ask any 3D questions do that counts. Um, shoot. I love you, Kim. You are awesome. <laughs> Amazing, Thanks, baby. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yes, any questions? <laughs> Anybody? Anybody? It's a lot to take in. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't have any questions. Usually, yeah, usually. we don't have questions on that. It's just, uh, it's just the beauty yeah. of the story, and you just kind of like take it all in, you know. <laughs> Did you, you didn't say anything about the turtles, or about the what? The turtles. Oh, the turtles. He's talking about the turtles. Thank you. Yes, I will talk about the turtles. Okay. The turtles come from when Ooh. Kali was first diagnosed. In the hospital, she was having a psychologist interact with her. And in that age group, what they do is they ask the children, is there an animal that you identify with? For getting you through the process and the procedures and all the, you know, the horror of what they go through. And for Kali, it was a turtle. And, you know, she saw it as 
when she had to do something, go through something that she didn't want to do, she could go back into her shell. And so the idea of the turtle was created and then like within a day somebody bought her a turtle. She and this turtle stayed with her, with her blanket in this little tub, <laughs> went everywhere. And people began to buy turtles. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of turtles. Turtles was our code word. And it fascinates me that it is actually one of the emojis in Google Plus, the turtle really. <laughs> but they turn up everywhere. People still to this day buy us turtles. We buried her with her favourite one. But yeah, it's the code word. And yeah, it's what got her through so much. And I was actually just talking last night about um, with Rowie about she had four vertebrae removed in her back when she relapsed and they put titanium in her back. And she hated it. She was rejecting it emotionally, mentally, physically, because she had to relearn to walk again. And I saw on a video yesterday that we watched, and it's got a scan of hers on it, and you can see the titanium and how much of her spine it actually took up. And one day it came to me, and I don't know what came first. I don't know if she created this or if this was meant to be something that was to be brought to her attention, but I said to her one day, that's your shell. Titanium is keeping you back safe and well. And she never complained about it from that day on. So the total idea was pretty powerful. And like I said, yeah, turtles still come our way. <laughs> hmm. And people, people in Hugo too that know, it's amazing, you know, some of you are awesome. If you find a turtle and you post it and if I happen to see it, it always warms my heart. Means a lot. Will do. Hmm. All right, Kim, thank you so much. Anyone else have any comments? If not, we're going to wrap it up. I just have one question. Uh, Kim, can you give me can you give me five animals that comes to your mind? Five animals that come to my you mind. You did this to me. I still haven't got my answer. What's up? <laughs> yeah, yeah well, obviously, turtle, dolphin. Does that count? Yes. Yeah, lion. Um, oh, God, what comes next? Uh, 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 uh. No pressure. Uh, seahorse. Perfect. Uh, one more. One more, one more, one more. <laughs> well, I got blank. Polar bears. Very awesome. Good. Awesome. He'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get back to me on that, JD. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. This is Roxy and Kim from Hukalo TV. And thank you for joining in on Storytime. And uh, tune in next week at the same bat time and same bat channel. That is at 4 p.m. I'm sorry, 5 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. my time in Central. But 5 p.m. every Saturday is Storytime. And upcoming events is the guided meditation tomorrow, which is 7 p.m. on the East Coast, and that is uh, hosted by the one and only in the room at the moment, JD or Johannes, as I like to call him. <laughs> All right, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll talk to you in the next now. Love everybody. Mwah. Thanks, Kim. Thank you, everyone, so much. Mwah.